that I knew before coming out. And all of them do extremely different things. Like I work on a security tool. Uh, one of my friends works in like enclaves and other kind of security-esque stuff, which is like the closest it gets to me. Another friend works on databases. Another friend works on uh, statistics and kind of um, trying to help other teams understand how to use statistics to tell what features to use or not use, um, different things like that. So it's a pretty diverse set of group, uh, or a pretty diverse group of people all under the same, you know, we're all software engineers, quote unquote, but have very different jobs and very different interests. Um, so yeah, so it, it, it's pretty interesting to, to work here and be surrounded by so many people who have very different backgrounds and um, focuses and stuff like that. It's, it's pretty cool. Let's see, are there any questions, anything at all? I have a question. Yeah, what's up? So when you were getting your bachelor's of uh, computer science, how did you like get a job offer? Like did, were, were recruiters like coming in and like asking yeah, so you personally great... or did you go to like a like a career ex expo or how did that work? Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, at Purdue, at least the kind of what happens is um, the, the computer science uh, department has companies coming in uh, almost immediate. So like, you know, start school like August 25th or something like that, somewhere around there. Uh, within about three weeks, you start having companies come in for uh, technical talks and recruiting uh, and they come in, you know, you have companies booked up for the next three months or so coming in and talking to you, trying to get you to apply and, uh, you know, uh, come work for them. Um, and then there's also be some amount of having connections to people that you know already. Um, so for example, like I had my internships with Northrop through my club. Uh, that's kind of how I got that contact. And then I got my job at Microsoft from knowing some people who already worked at Microsoft who had graduated a year early. Um, and so that's how I got like referrals there. Uh, so it's super helpful to know upperclassmen and kind of, uh, you know, form those relationships, uh, super helpful. Um, but yeah, and then also going to career fairs, like you said. So we have a few huge career fairs. It's really hard to like, it really depends on the school. Like at least for us, it was really hard to make yourself like really stand out there and make it like most of the time it was like, you'd talk to someone, they'd be like, cool, you're interesting, you should apply. Um, and that was kind of the end of it. I don't know how much impact it had on um, getting an interview or not, like actually going in physically and talking. I can only name like one or two instances of like where I know that that actually helped, but it's because my uh, resume and experience was so tailored to the position that like, if they had seen that resume anyways, they would have been interested. Um, I don't think that like me talking to them added anything in those cases. Um, so it's kind of like, you know, you'll, you'll kind of get a feel for it um, as you try it out. Um, but yeah, uh, plenty of opportunities and uh, just a lot of like companies coming in and talking and then you going out and applying to companies. It's kind of a two-way process. Does that answer your question, Jack? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, no problem. All right. And then as far as uh, internships, so I did two internships with Northrop Grumman uh, out in Cincinnati. Um, that was like a pretty interesting experience. I really enjoyed um, like being able to check out a city for a summer and not really be, you know, it's weird to like go move, you know, say you're going full time somewhere or even just picking a college somewhere, right? You're gonna be there for four years or, you know, more if you're or if you're full time possibly. Um, so it's nice to be able to go there for a summer and kind of check it out, figure out what you like, what you don't like. Is it too far from, you know, wherever you wanna be or is it is it just right or, you know, different things. Um, so it was a good experience for that. I really enjoyed the, the work I did there. Uh, I got some really fun projects that were, um, you know, I, I got there because of the CTF club and naturally I had some work to do on CTFs for them, which was like, you know, just like a good alignment of what I enjoyed. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think. And then, you know, I know plenty of friends from there now, which is super helpful that have gone on to like different places. Some are getting masters at Purdue or some are, 
you know, often other places in, in the industry. Um, so it's good to like build up that kind of like network of, of people, you know, like at this point, I know someone from more or less every major company that you could think of that has a presence out in Seattle. Um, and that's like super helpful as well. Just like talking, even just talking to people about like, what do you like about your job? What do you not like about your job or your team or whatever? Um, you know, all super helpful things to get some perspective on like kind of figuring out what you do or don't like about your own uh, job and position or, you know, help contextualize things. Can you talk a little bit about um, like the interview process and like, I remember you were saying last time about how um, some people were surprised that they went on a lot of interviews and didn't get offers, just kind of how that works. Yeah. Yeah. So my interview process, so my interview process for Northrop Grumman was non-existent because I uh, did a competition where they saw I did well, and that was kind of the technical part of the interview. And then the behavioral was like, oh, he's not a terrible person. Good job, Connor. Um so yeah, so that was kind of a, a very unique experience in that way. That year I also interviewed with State Farm and got an offer from them uh, for an internship. And that was kind of uh, interesting. It was, I submitted an application, got a call to do a phone interview for maybe half an hour, an hour. Um, and I don't really remember much from that interview. I don't think there was any live coding. I think it was just kind of like talking through things. Um, talking about what the position would be like and uh you know I, I think it was mostly just talking about technical things and then some form of behavioral as well uh, that's pretty common to have some you know some split between technical and behavioral um and then yeah and then got that offer um and then as far as full-time goes that was a lot more uh, intense you know it, it kind of gets more intense as the uh you know level of the position and like the the length of it goes up right so an internship is three months and um you know you're not expected to know everything and like just be like a, a perfect engineer or anything like that um so usually you have less interviews or uh less um difficult interviews um and then when you go to full time when you're interviewing for full time then it's a little harder and then when you interview for some position that's higher than entry level, then it's a little, even a little harder, so on and so forth, right? Um, but uh, another thing is like um, companies generally generally aren't looking for weaknesses. They're looking for like, what are you, what can you do? What are you good at? Uh, they're not generally looking to like trip you up or like trick you or be like, haha, you didn't know that thing. Um, like for example, I interviewed at Facebook and one of the interview questions was about something I hadn't like I hadn't taken the class that they're talking about yet and so I was like hey I haven't taken this class but I've taken something that's kind of a precursor to the class so can we talk about something in that range and then they did that and that was totally fine um, yeah so and then yeah so the interview process is typically a lot of live coding for at least for full time um, so you'll have either writing out on a whiteboard or in COVID land, you know, writing something out on like uh, some sort of like Word doc that's not an IDE, doesn't have like completion and stuff like that. It's as if you're just writing it, um, you know, you're writing it without any help generally. Um, and then, yeah, and then kind of talking through a problem, you know, the uh, interviewer will give you the problem. You ask some questions to clarify what they mean, what to do in this case, think of some edge cases, think of, you know, how do I want to, uh, you know, orchestrate this, uh, you know, talk through the code before you write it and then go write it and then talk through, okay, is this code that you wrote actually what you said you were going to write and does it work? Write some test cases for me to like double check that it actually does work or how would you check if it worked? Um, and then, yeah, so usually, so for my Microsoft interviews, I had four or three technical interviews just like that um, with multiple questions or multiple subparts or like, you know, once you solve one portion, then they add on a little something that makes it a little harder, or add another constraint or something. Um, and then I had one lunch interview that was a behavioral kind of figure out, you know, what do you like about, or what um, is Microsoft like, you know, what's the culture like, got to talk to what is, who is now my skip level manager. Um, 
so that was really nice to like actually talk to someone who I'd be working with on like a you know somewhat often basis. But yeah, I think that's uh, like pretty much what I have for for interviews. It's a uh, oh wait, and then like Miss Donna was saying, is like a lot of lots of rejection. Like uh, it sounds really great that I got interview or I got like offers from Northrop and Amazon and Microsoft, but those were like the only three offers I had, and that was backed with like hundreds of rejections and hundreds of like not even getting to like a phone call, which is insane to think about. But it's the reality of just like, you know, someone can throw away your resume for almost any reason. Like I had a I had a recommendation for Google and applied there and every single application was like an apps an immediate no. So like definitely don't feel bad about rejection. Like it's just kind of like a part of it and apply like everywhere and anywhere. All right, let's see, this uh, has a question. How many people did you know that dropped out of their CS program? And if so, why? Um, I definitely know that it happens. I don't know if I know anyone that did in like, that I was like close enough to like actually know why they did so. Um, but I imagine like, you know, I've, I've talked to like some people that have um, and kind of like why to drop out is some combination of like wasn't as interesting as I thought or like the parts that were um, that I thought were interesting turned into like just like really annoying and tough and like just didn't enjoy it at some point because like you know like there's a there's a difference between like taking like an AP Java class and then getting like a whole mat or a whole bachelor's degree in computer science right like there's a whole bunch of you know a whole bunch of information between then and there that um, you know, things you don't really think about, like discrete math or linear algebra, or, you know, there's, there's all these other things that are really fundamental to computer science that you typically don't think about when you have only taken like one AP class in it, right? Um, and so I think that a lot of it is just like, you know, realizing that they weren't as interested as they thought they were, or maybe they never were really super interested. And then they like, you know, I mean, computer science is by no means like an easy subject to get a degree in. So when you're you're met with like, I'm not interested to, and this is extremely hard, it, it would get, you know, compounds how hard it is to get through a degree. Um, so I think a lot of it is that. Um, I mean, I certainly struggled with some classes, but uh, it was always super interesting to me and I really wanted to learn and I'm a relatively motivated person. So it's not too hard for me to push through that. Because it was still like, this is definitely what I want to do. There's no questions there. Um, as far as your degree goes, do you think it was a lot more like uh, practical knowledge or a lot of like theoretical stuff and your job gave you the practical knowledge for the exact systems and stuff you were working with? Like, yes. did you feel prepared walking? Yeah, that's a good question. So I felt pretty prepared based on a whole bunch of me doing outside activity or like extracurricular kind of stuff and just being interested in what I did. Um, I was a TA all throughout college. Um, and so that also helped a ton because you're kind of, you know, I created homeworks and projects and stuff like that, that you, you know, you get a lot of good experience. Like I'm going to make something that has to be really well tested, um, create test cases for it, make sure that students don't, um, you know, make sure that students understand what's trying to be done that makes sense. Um, you get a lot of practical experience because you have a quote unquote customer, the customer being the student or the class, depending on how you look at it. Um, and so, yeah, yeah, like that was a really good experience. And then uh, through that also using a whole bunch of stuff that you don't really um, necessarily have to use in classes, right? Like getting actually good at using Git, um, for example. Um, like that's something that all of our classes use Git in the probably the worst way possible, which is every time you compile, it just commits to all your code. Um, and so in that way, it's like kind of like the worst way of using Git, they just use it to make sure that everyone's progress is saved every time that they don't lose anything. Uh, that's their goal. But like my goal in using Git is to actually organize things and make it so that's like, oh, like 
you know, at this point I had this feature working and then at some point later it broke. So I can revert back to that point and then figure out what went wrong along the way. Um, so yeah, so like just like a bunch of extracurricular things really helped with that. Um, so I felt prepared, but not because I just got, got a degree. I think the degree is really what you make of it. Um, and just going and doing classes, like certainly you'll, you can figure that stuff out on the job, but it's a lot easier to figure it out while you're in school and can, you know, I feel like there's a lot less pressure there when I just screw up a, a project that I don't really, you know, screw something up that, that at the end of the day doesn't really have a huge effect or anything like that. Um, makes things easier because now I feel like really comfortable doing a whole bunch of things where people are still like learning how to use the, the things that we use. Oh, let's see. Uh, yeah, so some of my courses, um, so can you talk about some of your courses being a TA, how things are graded, et cetera? Um, so my courses, I'm trying to think. So I, I mean, I took a whole slew of things at Purdue. There's two years worth of core classes. Uh, so you take uh, a Java course, your first semester, then you take a discrete math and a C programming course, your second semester. Your third semester, you take an intro to algorithms course and a hardware course. And then your fourth semester, you take a systems programming class. And that's your, those are your six core classes. They have to be done kind of in that order because they're prereqs for, you know, they're prereqs for each other. And then those core classes are prereqs for a whole bunch of other classes that are the, you know, three and 400 level, upper level, upper classmen classes. Um, and so I enjoyed, I really enjoyed the C programming, the systems programming, all the pretty low level stuff. Um, I really enjoy assembly. If anyone knows what that is, that's a fun time. Um, I don't recommend just going I'm and learning that. Saying, anyone who thinks that fun, that is not fun. I have never heard someone say that in anything other than terms that are, I can't repeat in school. Yeah. Yeah, that's can... that's generally how people view assembly. Um, yeah, so that's uh, the, like the weird quirk of mine is enjoying the really low level weird stuff. Um, so yeah, I, I, you could say I'm unique. Um, <laughs> but yeah, uh, so those like I took a I took three or two or three independent studies about reverse engineering and assembly and stuff like that. Um, malware analysis exploit development, stuff like that. I was, re I really enjoyed the security stuff. Um, those are some really cool classes. I'd highly recommend trying to do, you know, if, if you don't see a class or if you see that there's some gap in your, uh, what's offered, try to, um, you know, find a professor that you enjoyed taking a class with and try and see if they can do an independent study. At least at Purdue, that's pretty possible. I don't know about other schools. Um, but yeah, I didn't, have too tough of a time figuring that out and making that work. Um, and that was like a really helpful thing just because that's not something that's taught in school. Um, but I wanted to receive credit for it. And, uh, you know, it was a good, a good mixing of that, getting credit for something that's, you know, not something we have a formal class for. Um, and then being a TA was really fun. I really enjoyed that. I got to write a, um, a linter. So we had a code standard for the class that the classes that I TA'd, which means that your code has to look a certain way and do certain things. So for example, um, like a, an easy example you guys would understand is like just checking that things aren't null, uh, you know, checking that arguments to a function aren't null, something like that. Um, or, you know, make sure that the opening brace of an if statement is on the same line as the if, or it, maybe it should be on the next line, you know, that that's a choice, um, stuff like that. So I made a program to actually go and automatically check those kinds of things, uh, making sure that they happened and reporting if they didn't. And uh, that was a really cool project that gave me a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of experience doing kind of almost real work development because it would be go release this feature get a whole bunch of bug reports from students that things are broken, go fix the things. Yay, they're fixed. Okay, time to roll out a new feature. New feature breaks things, go fix them. Uh, it, it was really just like software development life cycle. Um, but I did that for like a solid year or two. Um, so that was like a really great experience. Um, yeah, really great experience. 
Um, can you elaborate on how your connection referral helped you secure your interviews at Microsoft? What types of, okay. Um, so as far as um, my connection to Microsoft, all that happens on like that side of things is someone says like, hey, you want to interview Microsoft? Cool, what's your email? And then they send a, uh, internally they um, refer you along with an email and then recruiting will reach out to you and say like, hey, this person referred you, um, let's have a phone call. And the phone call is a half hour, pretty low stakes kind of thing for them at least. Like, you know, it's not a very big time investment just to see if you are worth interviewing further. Um, and so I had that half hour phone conversation and then got a, uh, uh, a final round interview at, in uh, Redmond. Um, and so that's kind of like how Microsoft did it, at least for me, was just, you know, oh, you're referred, cool, you're probably good enough to interview, but let's just do a half hour phone call to make sure. Um, and I can elaborate on that because when I, I had won a scholarship um, from Society of Women Engineers and because of that, my name and email were forwarded to Microsoft and then they contacted me and that's why, that's how I got my interview over the phone, which then turned into an in-person interview in Redmond. So, um, so it sounds like that's still the same process that they're using, um, which, you know, they get referrals from people they already know and trust and value. And if those people refer you, they figure you're more worth our time than this stack of unknown resumes who we have no idea if they're worth our time. So, yep. Yeah, so it's a really good way for companies to kind of, uh, you know, and, and that's also a weird thing is Microsoft kind of, um, I don't know, it seems like they don't value that as much as other companies would. For example, like a lot of a lot of companies will give you, um, say you refer someone and they get a full time offer and they stay with the company for a year, typically you get some amount of money for that referral. Um, Microsoft doesn't do that, at least unless it's like kind of like director level, really high level stuff. Um, most other companies will give you like five or $10,000 just for like the fact that you referred someone and they stayed, the, they got hired and stayed at the company for some amount of time. Um, like for example, like I had a friend that referred me to Facebook and if, he, if I stayed there for, if I got the offer, stayed there for a year, he got $10,000. Um, so yeah, so every company is a little different, but definitely like in general, having a referral is uh, saying something uh, for most companies. Um, just to, you know, oh, there's someone that this person thinks would actually be really good at, uh, at the company. Um, but yeah, so, I mean, really it's just to help you secure an interview. It's not gonna push you through the interview process at all. Uh, it, it'll, it, it, it gives you, a very high chance of getting a, an opportunity and you still need to make that, um, you know, like prove that you uh, are like fit for the job and stuff like that. Uh, what types of clubs in college are highly recommended? Um, I really enjoyed my CTF club. That's what I did in college. I don't think I can recommend that to everyone. In fact, I, I explicitly don't recommend that to everyone. Um, but I think it's really just about finding something you really enjoy. Um, and it's a great way to kind of explore things that, um, you know, maybe maybe you're debating between doing software engineering or like, you know, more like architect design kind of job or, you know, whatever the, the case may be. I'm sure there's some sort of club out there at your college that will let you kind of explore those things. And I highly recommend doing that. Um, and then just pour as much time as you want to into like the thing that really makes you like interests you. Um, that's how I've, you know, learned so much about security in like a very short amount of time. Like going into college, I knew nothing about C or assembly or security. I knew Java and Java only. And I knew AP level, APCS level Java at like a TA level, you know, that's, that's what I knew. <laughs> And so to elaborate on that, when Connor graduated, we didn't have this big program of classes that we have now. We didn't yeah, we have... we had just started having principles around, and I took a week of it and then dropped it because I was bored. But so like, I mean, it was it was yeah. a different time, right? It was a different yeah. time. There weren't but... options for for the classes that we have now, and um, so yeah, so so like he said, he left high school just knowing Java. It's not about how many languages you know, it's about how well you understand the logic of programming. 
And um, another thing that I want to elaborate on with the clubs that I think is important is sometimes people get so wrapped up in what clubs look good on resumes. And what really looks good is when you can show that you have a love and a passion for something and you can show um, leadership, follow through and dedication within that club. Um, another thing you could do is let's say you're passionate about a certain area, you could look at how you could reach out with that area with your coding expertise to help that area in some way. That would be another thing. But you, you want to be able to have the stuff that you put on your resume speak about your character. You want everything on your resume to speak about you. You don't want it to just be a whole bunch of junk that you did because you think it looks good to some person you don't even know yet. Um, your time in college is going to be at a premium. And so if you join clubs that involve people that include the same interests you have, not only will you love what you're doing, you'll also meet people who have the same interests as you, which is also another important thing too. Yeah, it's super true. Uh, a lot of the things that uh, are on my resume are like kind of like the, the biggest talking points I have are the ones that are like one bullet or, a, you know, there are a few bullet points and, uh, you know, it's stuff that you wouldn't think of normally as being something super interesting such as like you know on my resume uh all that i have for like taing is just like that i made a linter and i did a few things and it sounds like it's like a pretty um you know it, it sounds like a cool enough thing to do but doesn't sound super interesting and then having being able to talk about it really gives that kind of the depth and uh understanding to the interviewer of like what i was able to do and what i did and what i have experience doing um, and kind of explaining like i said like the software development life cycle of like feature bug fix feature bug fix you know using git every single day running regression tests on that code writing new tests every time we get a bug to make sure that bug doesn't come back up stuff like that it's all this stuff that like you're not i'm not gonna be able to fit all that information into a resume and i don't want to because when i talk to someone i will be able to explain all these things and the resume is just to give them a high level understanding of kind of what i've done um, but yeah so it's, it's really important just to have things that you can really talk about and like show you're passionate about and um you know kind of show what you're interested in so yeah, so as far as clubs, uh, do things you're interested in, find things you're interested in, try clubs out that are new that you've never thought about trying. And then when you, you know, maybe you find something you really like that you never would have tried before, maybe you find something you don't like, that's also information. You know, it's a, it, like I said, like I hated Cincinnati when I was like, I, I hated being like the thought of being in Cincinnati as a full-time job was terrible to me. But I'm really glad I did it because now I know that I really wanted to get out of the Midwest. It wasn't just like being in the Chicagoland area. It was just like, no, I just don't like the Midwest. I want to move. And now I'm on in Seattle. So like, I don't know. There's a there's a lot of things that like you learn and like, you know, failure or like not liking something is not actually failure. It's still like learning something, you know, like getting rejected still learn something from it. Why did I get rejected? Oh, well, like this specific question, I didn't really know how to answer. Let's go figure out how to answer that properly next time. Or, you know, all these different things. There's always something to learn even from whatever you fail or screw up or whatever. Exactly, see, <laughs> yep, yeah. It's a crazy, crazy thing. I also willingly moved to a cornfield in Indiana. So it says something about me, right? <laughs> yeah, but now you purposely permanently moved out to Seattle so yes I uh, highly recommend to anyone looking to move uh, can you talk about the I know one of the things that I um, stress with the students is just about how they need to be able to set their own timelines and create like a task management system can you talk about how like in your real life job your program you know a project manager gives you a task and how that works and your responsibilities and check-in and all that stuff yeah, um, I am assigned no tasks to, I assign myself everything I do. Um, so the project I'm working on is a very um, kind of, the project is parallel to the things we do and is not tied to the general code base that everyone works on. So it's me and one teammate that work on this, this project. Um, and so the two of us went from, like when I joined, he had started the design of this project. I helped him finish that design and then go start implementing things. And so literally what we did was we were given a super vague description of what we needed to get done with the knowledge that there's an old version of this code that, and it should work kind of the same, 
but different internally, which is extremely, extremely, uh, you know, um, a, a really good explanation of what to do. Um, and so naturally we were like, well, this is great. Let's figure out what it does externally and how it works. And then let's figure out how it works internally and what we can change to make it better. And then go design that out in uh, you know, a really long form design document and then go create tasks and items to like, hey, let's break this project out into like, basically like, uh, you know, you've got epics, stories, tasks, uh, which are all just different lengths of like, um, different lengths of uh, time to implement basically. So like, for example, let's say that you were to break up a grade book project uh, program into like these things, right? So like the overall goal is to create the grade book, that'd be like your epic. And then within that, you have to like create something to represent a, a student. You have to create something to represent the grade book. You have to create something to calculate the grades and all these statistical things about it, right? That'd be your stories. And then there's tasks under that to do like very specific things. So we broke out everything into that. And uh, and then basically we just got man like manager looked at all these things and it was like, cool, looks good start working. And then we started working. Um, and now we're like two weeks out from finishing the, the end of that. Um, and then we'll have to go and deploy this into production and make sure everything works and do some more testing. Um, but yeah, so, so my experience has been very different because typically people think of like, well, the manager tells you what to do, what to code, and then you code it. And my experience has been, I figure out how this thing should work. I design it, I implement it. I, during implementation, realize that something is screwed up in the design because we thought something worked a different way. Go back to the design, rework that real quick, make sure that everyone's on the same page and then continue on with the, design, with the uh, development. Um, so that's been a really interesting experience, uh, but super fun. Uh, I like the ambiguity part of things. That was like one of my classes in college was a, a compiler's class that was the most ambiguous class ever. Um, and by ambiguous, it mean I mean just like they didn't directly tell you what to do, but you're implementing a language that's very well known, has very rigid, like this is how it should work. And so you just have to go look things up for your own. And that's like a really key uh thing that's been helpful is just like i don't know you know there's no way that you know everything uh so get really good at, at finding things out for yourself uh the rain in seattle is awesome um it's my favorite part actually yeah totally um the hiking and stuff in seattle is great uh i live in a on a hill so any which way i go is a hill which is kind of a fun little workout um the food here is amazing absolutely amazing um that's probably some of my favorite stuff and then a, a bunch of like really pretty scenery and like mountains and things that you don't have out in the midwest yeah all those things uh is the cs field oversaturated i hear now there are too many cs journalists but not enough specialists um i don't really know if i am like able to answer that with any sort of data but my feeling on things is basically that uh um you know based on my opinions and what i've seen I, I don't know if there's too many cs people really like there's always going to be more and more people applying and like there's going to be some question of like how many seats could, how many people could you possibly teach cs to and how many jobs are there but it seems like jobs are always going up there's always someone looking to hire. It's really a question of like, how quality are the candidates? I think that's usually the determining factor, right? Like, so for example, turning out a whole bunch of people to have CS degrees just because they have CS degrees, probably a bad thing. Turning out a whole bunch of people who are really quality CS degrees because we need really quality CS people, probably a good thing. Um, I think it really comes down to that and finding people who, I mean, I don't really, you know, if you're, you know, a lot of people have uh, this like idea that you know you have to be in uh, the degree for the passion of the thing and always love it and love everything about it. Uh, I don't totally buy into that. I think it's probably better for you if you enjoy it and stuff. But like if your enjoyment comes from like making a, a good amount of money and then being able to be free to do whatever you want in your free time and you really enjoy that, that's great. Um, you know, I, I don't think that there's really a problem of too many people being in CS. I think it's just a question of 
you know, finding people who are, uh, you know, come out of college and are like pretty good at what they do um, and can really learn more and become better at it. You think it helps you um, be more marketable if you do have a specialty? Um, I think maybe to some degree, but also, I mean, the, at the end of the day, you're right, I'm a security person and every single interview I did except for one or two, which were for very specific jobs at security firms was coding, like just doing coding questions. If your specialty is coding and you're a CS person, like, you know, I, I don't know if I really call that a specialty. Um, you know, you, you could specialize in algorithms, but I would argue that everyone should have a pretty working you know, grasp on algorithms in order to be in CS or at least be pretty successful in CS. Um, and so, yeah, I don't, I, I think that my, my specialty definitely helped me get placed on which team I got placed on. I don't know if it actually got me any closer to the actual offer though. I, I think it's just like, you know, it showed that I'm passionate. It showed that I care. It showed that if I want to do something, I can do it. But there's a bunch of different ways to display those same things. Where do you see yourself in 10 years? Hopefully in Seattle. Um, uh, no, but seriously, uh, I don't know. Uh, I really enjoy uh, the idea of being an uh, independent contributor, which is basically uh, short for I enjoy not being a manager. Um, and so I I think that uh, based on like kind of like the work I do, Microsoft's probably the only place I would want to work as of right now, um, and probably in the distant future as well. I would imagine that's kind of the same. Um, the only people that do the kind of work I want are Amazon and Microsoft, and I don't particularly want to work at Amazon for my own reasons. Um, and yeah, so there's a bunch of different other companies that, you, that I could work for out here, possibly, right? Like there's a huge Facebook presence, there's a huge Google presence, there's a huge, you know, bunch of other big companies, a bunch of other small companies, everything in between. Um, but I'm really interested in the, you know, security um, at a very large scale, um, working with a bunch of different people and kind of being able to move around within the company to have different roles as I, you know, uh, grow and learn. Um, and that's a really cool opportunity. Like I said, Microsoft's like a thousand companies rolled under one. So if I chose to go and have, you know, go on to a different team or something like that, I could have a totally different experience and be in the same company and be able to kind of do the same, you know, have that same end North Star goal of, you know, security affecting a lot of people um, without having to sacrifice, like just doing the same thing over and over and being on the same team and not growing and stagnating. All right, let's see. What's your favorite thing about CS in college? Um, I don't know. Favorite. What was that? I think the question was least favorite, but you can talk about Oh, favorite. least favorite. Least favorite thing about CS in college. I can easily talk about that. Favorite thing might be a little harder, honestly. Um, least favorite thing? Uh, probably just like the sheer amount of, I don't know, like, the sheer amount of work, I think, like, I, I just know, like, there's so many friends I have that are in, like, still in school, and now I'm out, and I realize how much work went into, like, everything, no matter what, like, I took, like, 12 and 14, and I think the most credit hours I took was 16 my freshman year, but that was for, like, you know, with, like, two or three credits that were really, really easy and dumb, and, you know, um, I wouldn't even really count them. So I, I took light course loads and it was still like a ton of work every week, right? You've got like, you know, you're studying for exams, you're doing projects. I was a TA, you know, try and have a personal life on top of that. You know, it's a lot to juggle. Um, try, try to stay fit and not just like turn into a couch potato. Um, like all those things, it's just like a really hard balancing act, especially coming out of high school where everything's very, you know, well, like, you know, parents made dinner or I go out to eat or whatever. And then, you know, I, I think that that's the, the hard part is just that balancing act. Um, I think I still had more time at the end of the day than when I did when I was at From, just because From, you know, I had school from what, 725 to 225 and then 
you know, sport practice. I was a wrestler and played football. Um, and then, you know, between that and like homework and stuff, you know, you're, you're kind of doing nothing but that. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's just the balancing act, figuring out for yourself because that from did super structure. It's just like, well, you go to school, like the school is spoken for for those seven or eight hours or whatever it is. And then you've got practice or not. And then you've got, you know, got to do some homework um, or, you know, whatever your, your interests are and then uh, eat some dinner and then get some sleep, you know? So, yeah. Um, fair enough, Andrew. Um, so as I go into a coding interview, what kind of general concepts should I review before? Um, I think uh, there's plenty of good sites out there that will kind of, um, you know, teach you a bunch of uh, good things to know. Uh, I think Leak Code and Hacker Rank are the two that are probably the most popular. Um, let me find the. What were those sites? Leak Code. Uh, I'll just put them in chat one second. Oh, that is weird. Oh, Zoom. Uh, so Leak Code and Hacker Rank are like the two two popular ones that are free, unless you don't unless you want to pay for them and pay for like very specific like, oh, we know that this company uses this question. Pay us and we will let you see it or something like that. But you don't really need it in general. Um, but yeah, so those are, those are great ways to, you know, you'll, you'll be given a problem like you would at a coding interview and, uh, you know, you, you write out the code, run it and they'll run test cases against it and then let you know if you passed or failed the, the thing and let you keep trying until you, you pass it. Um, and those are really helpful just to figure out like what kinds of algorithms, what kinds of data structures, how can I write this, uh, stuff like that. Um, in general, knowing big O notation is really helpful. I don't know if AP Java does that anymore. Well, they kind of took it out. I mean, we talked about efficiency, but they took it out and then we would have reviewed it more for the AP, but you know, then the world shut down. So yeah. Uh, and most of the students in here had me last year for, for AP. Can you also talk about how like the languages that you do your coding interviews in? Yeah, so uh, language wise, they generally don't give a crap what you use, like you can use whatever you want. Um, for example, I could use assembly if I really wanted to, I'm sure uh, they would just be really confused and it would, I mean, it wouldn't be a good time. The point is, is they really don't care what language you use, they care that you know how to code in a language. Um, because, like Ms. I was saying earlier, the, you know, knowing how to code well will translate into other languages, even if you don't know the language yet. Um, you know, there's going to be some quirk to every language or some set of things. It's like, oh, you have to do this a little differently in this language, or it looks a little different, or it doesn't have that ability, but it has this other ability that lets you do kind of the same thing. Um, you know, those are all things that are largely just, you know, you'll learn at, on the job, right? Like I've never touched C sharp code before Microsoft, and now I code in C sharp every day. And I, you know, it's not like I ever, I, I didn't take a class on it. I, I, you know, you figured it out. You do a little like six hour tutorial thing on Pluralsight, which is like a really nice website that you'll have at major companies um, and did like a six hour course on that. And I felt like I only needed about 15 minutes of it to understand how it works. Um, it, it's really just, you know, learn one language well and I'm sure that you'll be forced to pick up some other ones through college as well. Find some ones you're interested in. Um, like for example, I'm doing an OCaml course, which is a functional programming language right now, just for fun, just to kind of learn some stuff and learn some more like rigorous theory of computing stuff rather than just, you know, how do I make a for loop kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, let's see. When using Git in a team, what are effective practices and tips? How should I set up branches? That is a totally team by team thing. Um, it, it really just depends on the workflows and like, you know, uh, for example, like, are you all working on the same feature, right? Are you all working on like the same kinds of files and stuff? That's gonna get a lot uglier, a lot faster because you have to like go merge changes into the same, you know, to the same files and, you know, you might, you might run into merge conflicts more often versus say, say maybe everyone on the team has their own feature that's all, you know, all the codes in their own separate files that never touch each other, then you guys could all work 
on you know the same branch and it wouldn't matter um you know it, it's just really a, a matter of what um what the workflow is how often are you going to do a pull request to like merge this all those changes in um stuff like that like for example i work with one other person and we sometimes work on the same file sometimes we don't and based on that that's will tell us how often we try to merge with each other's code to make sure that we resolve conflicts early and often um Can you real quick um i know that many students know what git is but i don't mm -hmm. know if they all do yeah uh, if we were in the classroom we would have learned it and been using it by now but we're in a different mm -hmm. environment so if you can just explain what it is okay. yeah sure yeah, so Git is a, uh, they call it uh, source control. Um, and so it's, it, it's a way of keeping track of changes in your code. Um, for example, let's say that I'm, you know, it, it's a way to, to control changes and then also share the code. So I will have a Git repo, which is just, you know, a, usually it's a, a repo per project and that just kind of encapsulates the whole thing. That's the top level, you know, biggest thing, biggest umbrella. And then um, I will, you know, uh, put all the code I have in there. And then uh, as I make changes and updates to so say I add a feature, right? Then I make a, a commit and add that all to um, the repository. And then, um, you know, I will see that change, right? I'll see like, oh, well, like between this, uh, between the beginning and this commit, these things changed. And then say I had a bug that pops up and like, maybe this bug wasn't here three commits ago, then I can go back and see like, oh, what changed? Like, what could this, what could be causing this bug? Um, and so it's, that's kind of like what it's use cases for. It's also for making sure that when two people are modifying a file and you want to have both of those changes in there, that's a way, it has ways of, of combining those two um, to make sure that it, uh, you know, it, it still works. And it's not just like you two trying to figure out, you know, copy and paste line by line, like, oh, well, like this line should go here and that line should go there. It, it has ways of automatically doing that and then showing you when there's conflicts. But yeah, so yeah, so the, as far as branches goes, it's totally a decide on your team, talk about it, figure it out uh, within your team. Um, uh, so as far as Git being online or command line version, I suggest using the command line for everything or at least learning how to use it because it makes you way faster and way more effective. If I had to do half the things I have to do um, through online only, I would, it would take me so much longer um, because, you know, at the end of the day, the command line has every single thing you need in it the 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 website you know the the user interface will only show you some amount of buttons if it had a button for every single thing you could do this whole screen would be buttons and it'd have pages of buttons it just wouldn't work well um, and so i really suggest using the command line uh, that's something i started doing when i was at purdue and that has paid dividends uh, since then um, just like getting used to linux and using the command line and just like you, you know now i now I like fly around and, uh, you know, I, I couldn't think of any other way to use a computer um, when doing like code stuff. It's always command line for me. Um, and now like my, my laptop is always, it's Linux. It, it, you know, I barely touch the mouse unless I'm surfing the web. Um, it's very nice. I enjoy it greatly. Um, so to add on to what you guys are saying in our computer labs, you guys aren't able to use the command line. So when we used Git last year, we had um, GitHub Desktop. We also had, I had Git set up within Android Studio, within Xcode. So that way students could do their work. They could push, pull their commits, everything within the, um, the software. Um, in terms of PowerShell, I know you guys can't access PowerShell in the school, but I don't know if you're able to do the command line prompts with it. I, everything changes year to year and I haven't been able to test those things in the lab. So, But I do agree with, with Connor that it's super useful to know how to use command line prompts. And a lot of times if you're watching uh, online tutorials, you'll see that most of them use all the command line prompts. And so that's one way you can pick them up, especially just learning a lot of the like basic commands, like how to change directories and how to list your files and just yep. how to see certain things. I mean, it's, it's really, that is very, very helpful. Um, but, you know, in our labs, we, we have limitations on your own computer. You don't. Um, yeah. 
So yeah. Yeah, I'd highly recommend like you can download VirtualBox uh, and set up a virtual machine. So that would make it so that like even on a Windows uh, laptop or you know computer, you could set that up and then run like Linux or another you know another Windows or something like that. I use well. If you're just going to use Windows, then you can use the, the machine as is and use the command prompt. I When I'm tip talking about command line, typically I'm talking about uh, Linux command line. Uh, that's what I use the most. And um, well, since my working for Microsoft, I don't really use that as much, at least in work life. But personal life, it's, it's all Linux for me. Um, and command versus PowerShell, typically I default to PowerShell just because as far as I know, PowerShell is a super set of command prompt. So like command prompt has like, basically it has like a bunch of things that are in your path that it can run. I'm almost positive PowerShell can do, can run all those same things. And then it also has like the nice PowerShell features of like, you know, having all these uh, commandlets and stuff. And like the project I'm writing right now has a whole bunch of PowerShell commandlets to it. Um, but yeah, so I use PowerShell a lot. All right. Do we have any last minute questions? We're almost out of time. Does anyone at Microsoft use a Mac instead of something running Windows? And is that frowned upon? Um, I'm sure that there's some amount of people that run like Linux or some other thing. I, I would imagine that it's mostly between running Linux or Windows rather than Mac. I don't think that Mac really has any nice compatibility things with our products that would make it nicer than using Linux or Windows, but I don't know. I'm sure there's someone in the company that does that. Um, and there's certainly people who run Linux uh, in the company, um, but it's just, you know, by default, you're going to get a Windows machine and most of our development stuff is set up for Windows just because, you know, obviously it's a little, little cheaper. Um, but yeah. Um, I'm sure there's someone. I don't actually know, though. All right, Connor, any last words of advice? Um, I don't know. There's a lot of advice between the, the two hours I've done. <laughs> uh, I don't know. Uh, take care of yourself during COVID. I know that things are kind of uh, tough right now, even like even for me who is out of college and has a full-time job at a, a nice company that, you know, pays me well and has nice benefits. Like it's still not easy and it's uh, not fun. So um, definitely take care of yourself. Um, yeah, I've been trying to get out and do some more hikes and stuff, get outside and not just stay inside and turn into a couch potato. It's good stuff, um, but yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much for your time. And um, you guys had a lot of great questions. I, what I love is that the, the questions that were asked this period were different from the questions that were asked last time Connor spoke with us. So we definitely got a good variety. And like I did last time, I recorded his talk last time. I also recorded it this time as well. And I'll post the link um, in that folder on Schoology in case you wanted to refer back to something he said. Um, I, I did miss like the first five minutes because I forgot I wasn't recording it, but that was just the introduction stuff. And so it's the same. I'm curious on that. It's the same as the other first five minutes. Yeah. So. Um, yeah. All right. Well, if, if you have any other follow-up questions or things come to mind, um, I can always forward your information off to Connor. Um, but thank yeah, I'd be you. happy to talk to anyone. Thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate you taking time out of your day and uh, and speaking with us. So yeah, of course. And uh, enjoy that lovely Seattle. I love Seattle. It's so beautiful. Oh yeah, it's it's a good time. Can I, yes, Anna. Yeah. Can I, can I? Can we talk like after? I mean, like like. Wait, like, can I talk to? Like Connor. Can you talk to Connor? I mean, that's uh, a yeah. Uh, yeah, sure. I have like a more specific question. Yeah, that's fine. Um, so those of you that are, it, the period's over, so you're welcome to, to go. I will see you on Wednesday. Have a great day. Work on your homework. Peace out. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.